climate change is already a problem, including the southwest US, where we've already observed warming of one and a half degrees Fahrenheit or more. That's starting to affect ecosystems. We've got extreme heat waves, sea level rise. And then looking forward, we could see really devastating impacts. Loss of major ecosystems, disappearance of Arctic ice. At warming of two degrees, we'd lose all the tropical coral reefs. Tucson would start having a climate like Death Valley in the summer, which would be over 110 degrees. And of course, very serious threats to food security as well. What can we compare the climate change risk to? Major epidemics, things like the Great Plague that killed millions, the First World War in terms of lives lost. I don't think it's as severe as meteorite impacts that destroyed the dinosaurs, but it certainly could have very devastating effects on the economy. Now ask people, what kind of car do you drive? And they'll say, oh, well, I, you know, I drive something. And I'll say, well, what kind of mileage does it get? And they'll say, oh, I don't know. You know, I get 25 miles to the gallon. And I say, OK. And I hold this plastic bag up. And this bag has almost a pound of sand in it. And I say, that is the weight of the carbon dioxide gas that you put into the air from your car every single mile that you drive. If that red sand falling out of the back of your car, people would be complaining. If it were smelly, people would have been complaining. Unfortunately, CO2 is colorless, odorless, and it just vanishes into the big atmosphere around us. It just has large consequences if you start doubling the CO2 which was in the atmosphere to begin with. If we want to limit warming, we have to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and we need to have what's called net neutral emissions by 2050, which is that any greenhouse gases we emit would have to be compensated by capturing carbon. The CO2 problem is a waste management problem. You keep dumping it in the atmosphere, and the bulk of it keeps piling up. This is a cumulative problem, and we need to figure out how to stop. I was the research engineer at the biosphere, and Klaus was a professor at Columbia at that point. And he would come through town periodically and breeze into my office and we would talk for a half hour and then he would take off and continue on his way and, and I would take a nap because <laughs> you've talked to Klaus, you know what that's like. And uh, at the time that Columbia University pulled out of the biosphere, Klaus and I decided to start a company in Tucson devoted towards understanding the possibilities of doing direct air capture of carbon dioxide. That's the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. We started to ask, where in the environment can you collect the CO2? Uh, whether air capture was technologically possible at a scale where it would make a difference to the climate, whether energetically it made sense, economically would it possibly have a future, you know? And just in general, what did it look like? You gotta turn it on first. First of all, we don't want to blow the air around and fan the air because that costs money we didn't need to pay. The wind is perfectly capable of delivering the CO2. Uh, then we need surfaces on which the CO2 binds. This is a polypropylene sheet embedded into this, are these polystyrene particles of the anion. There were a couple of ahas along the way. One of them was, I'm sure Klaus has mentioned, the moisture swing phenomenon with this material we're working with. We have a filter, the resin material, when it's dry, it really loves CO2, and if it's wet, it gives it back. So, this is the, the resin material. I can open this and give the plant access to this material, which has a lot of CO2 in it, and inside it is moist. The beauty is that it's simple in conceptual operation. Put it outside, let it dry, pick up CO2, bring it in the box, make it wet, and gives it back off. 
and we stumbled into this at some level by dumb luck. But we, we worked on it and we found that this material can concentrate the CO2 hundredfold. Or put another way, we move 99% of all the air molecules which were in the way. You can put out about half a gram. That was a game changer. You know, that was where all the directions we had on this technology stopped and we turned left and we went that way. One unit of air only does 30. Those are very exciting and very heady times. And that's when we sort of said, wow, this, is, this could be real. You know, this is important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I was excited when I heard they were moving to Arizona because I think that the technologies they're working on, the air capture and the other research, is a really important area of research. Our solution is to pull CO2 directly out of the air using our artificial trees, which pull CO2 a thousand times faster than natural trees. So we recover the carbon, dispose of it, or recycle it into carbon-based raw materials and fuels. This is why we... We have reached a point where we understand how it works, and now we have to engineer a real system. And that costs money. Close to saturation, 22 part per... I think in two years you have a machine which you look at and you say you could actually work. Then I think there's a five-year stretch where you actually have to now move from having a technology which sort of works to actually mass producing it. That means you have to build up supply chains, put it all together, find out who can build that stuff, where is the factory which can do it, because in the end, you have to make a lot of it. That's, that's the one I couldn't read, but yeah. minutes or seconds, no, no, that's no, a big second. difference. This entire industry, this entire technology is just infantile in, in, its, in its maturity. So, you know, there are huge hurdles to overcome. We are hindered on both sides. Right? On the one side, you have people to tell you that climate change is a hoax. On the other side, we are also getting hit head on by the moral hazard argument, which says, well, if you, if you do that, then people won't change their lifestyle because they think they have this way out. If you say, I want to solve the problem with lifestyle changes, and since 1980 we try to convince people to do that, and we still have failed to do that, maybe we should consider the possibility that we should throw other solutions at the problem as well. We need the full portfolio of effort to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Energy efficiency, moving to renewable energy dietary changes, but then the longer term solutions, one would be carbon capture and storage, are the ones that are much more innovative and challenging. The more I think about the scale of the problem, the more impressed I get with the scope of the work that we're attempting to do here. What I want to say to them is, please develop this technology fast and cheaply, because if we've only got 12 years to reduce emissions by half, then we really have to get our act together.